Hi, good afternoon. This is Roy Oppenheim. This is our 15th week of Zoom at noon. We're back at where this all started. And I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, uh, this is being sponsored again by our law firm Oppenheim Law, as well as our, our title company, Weston Title and Escrow. Today, we're going to be focusing on why is this the perfect time to sell or refinance your home? And uh, we'll be discussing a number of issues. The first thing we'll be talking about, as usual, is the weekly unemployment and economic update, pandemic update, consumer behavior, how much cash is available and then it's accumulated uh, in the banks and the money markets. Then we're going to be talking about listings and sales, refinancing, and then we're going to be talking about remote closing and buying site unseen. The first few uh, topics, of course, correlate to uh, what's going on in the real estate and the, for, and, and the refinance market because it has to do with consumer behavior and what's going on on a macroeconomic basis. For those of you that are new, our firm was founded, a law firm was founded in 1989 by Ellen Polowski, my partner and my wife, Jeff Sherman, who's, who's here today as our partner, has been with us for, for over well over a decade. And uh, collectively, we have well over 75 years of, of legal experience. And I want to thank uh, Paula Vergara also, as well as Jeff and Ellen, for helping uh, put these presentations together week after week. As many of you know, we uh, were guides through the last economic crisis back in 2008. And uh, we're here again to guide us uh, ourselves through this, this mess. This mess, of course, is a little bit different than the one last time around, which was, which was really more of an economic crisis. And this one's kind of like a trifecta. You have a health crisis, an economic crisis, as well as, as, a, as a remarkable amount of social and political upheaval. And it is uh, through these three factors that, that we all have to figure out where we're going, how we're getting there, and how we're going to survive and thrive during this crisis. And make no, no, no bones about it. There will be companies that thrive. There will be individuals who thrive. And there will be individuals uh, who don't thrive and don't do particularly well, as well as companies. And it's up to you to decide which group you're going to be in. Clearly, uh, we were in one group last time, and we're going to be in that same group this time. And those of you who join us and are part of this journey, uh, we welcome you. So last week, we, we talked about uh, the unique opportunity. We had a unique opportunity to hear from Judge Dennis Bailey, uh, who is a member of our judiciary. And he was talking about how during these unprecedented times, uh, the, the legal system is starting to permeate and change, both for, for good as well as sometimes not for good but certainly a very interesting way to bring the courthouse closer to, to the community. This week, we're gonna discuss the variables that make this particular time a unique opportunity to both sell your home or refinance your home. Glenn Kelman, uh, the chief executive of Redfin said the following, there is an e-commerce mentality sinking into the American consciousness. People wanna be able to trade a house like they trade a stock. And so we're going to continue to uh, talk about these particular issues. Uh, Next page, please. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's go over the weekly unemployment and economic update. People are telling me I'm not talking loud enough. I thought I was. I apologize. Okay. So let's talk about the pandemic spike there, there, in terms of unemployment. Uh, there's been a, a change in unemployment benefits, uh, as as we know. As we if we take a look at the the, uh, the the big yellow thing, that that's the number of folks who've been applying for unemployment. That is now coming down. If we take a look at prior recessions, it, it's not even comparable. But if we continue to drop quickly, we, we could end up being on, on those, those trend lines. But right now, the number of unemployment that, unemployed is, is quite remarkable. If we go to the next, uh, the, the, the next picture, the, the, the purple uh, uh, bar graph, we're seeing uh, the number of jobless claims. And, that, and the number of jobless claims is, is starting to drop very precipitously if we go down the slide. Uh, of course, it's nothing like it was pre-coronavirus, pre but we're seeing that the number of claims is, is dropping. And so that, that of course, uh, gives people some, some sense of optimism uh, in terms of, of, of a comeback. Go to the next page. Uh, the, the next issue we have is uh, permanent unemployment. If we go from uh, January uh, 19 all the way to, to May 20th, uh, uh, right now we're seeing that the number of folks who are permanently unemployed is starting to increase from 4 to 5%. Uh, that, that becomes a big issue because these are people who will be institutionally and permanently uh, displaced from, from the job market. As we, as we take a look at the next slide, we'll see that, that that's very different than, than the headline unemployment. Right now, we're seeing it start to come down uh, at the 13% uh, little arrow at the top there. 
would suggest that it's coming down. And of course, the, the permanent un unemployed is coming up to 5%. Those two will converge over time. They'll probably converge somewhere around 2010 in, the, in that 10% range, which is two notches below uh, 13, right, right around where the arrow is. And that's very important because that, that's going to create headwinds uh, in terms of, of the growth of, of our economy as well as the housing market. Next. Uh, in terms of the pandemic, uh, you know, we all know what's going on. Uh, the reality is that, uh, that the cases keep going up, the number of deaths keep going up. But what's interesting is, uh, is that uh, in the United States, uh, it keeps going up. And in Europe, it's starting to go down. A lot of this may have to do with uh, just uh, the fact that they were able to tamper it down earlier than we were or that they had more social distancing. It's, it's unclear why. But the next slide is very interesting, is that even though our cases are still going up, the number of deaths as a percentage of cases is dropping precipitously. If we go to the trend line, we're seeing that a real divergence on the right side there. Uh, we're seeing that, that new cases are up 20% on a 14-day moving average, but the number of deaths are down 43%. And so this kind of goes to our thesis that ultimately uh, the economy is probably going to remain open, more people are going to contract it, and, and less and less people as a percentage are going to die, notwithstanding the fact that that's some immunologists are suggesting that you're looking at well over 500,000 or a million people could easily die over the next few years, depending on when the vaccine is, is developed, if a vaccine is ever developed, and then you'll end up possibly with herd immunity. But the good news is that if we can come up with, with a therapeutic care uh, and, and these kinds of diseases can be treated in such a way that, that they're not it's something that, that is perceived as, as an automatic uh, death wish on someone, uh, you will be able to, to survive and keep the economy open. If that doesn't happen, the economy likely will get shut down. Uh, consumer behavior, very interesting. Um, consumer spending has de uh, declined to 1959 numbers, which is unbelievably, arguably the sharpest decline in history, apart maybe from the Great Depression. Sh restrictions on mobility and business closures are, have, of course, have limited spending. Restrictions in travel and redirect has redirected the use of vacation savings to home improvement, which is which is absolutely critical. And then after months of staying at home, people with income or receiving government benefits are spending on big ticket items related to family entertainment, pools, boats, RVs, house renovations. Uh, those that do not, sorry, those that do not have a house are now looking for a house because they have some money saved in the bank. And, that's, and this is all part of what we're talking about here. Uh, consumer spending behavior during the pandemic. If we look at the top 25%, which is the bottom blue, we're seeing that their change in consumer habits uh, have changed the most and has then rebounded the least. And in part, that's because they have more discretionary consumption habits and thus they can regulate how much they're going to spend. Folks at the bottom 25% drop precipitously, but they're very close back to where they were. Their, their consumer spending habits are only down 5% versus uh, some of the top 25% is still down 20% when they were previously down as far as uh, maybe 35% or whatever that number is there. Uh, so that's also an, an, an interesting issue. Uh, next page. So retail sales, May 2019 to May 2020. Uh, you can look at it two ways. On the left, the light blue has changed from a year ago. The dark blue has changed from uh, the previous month. Uh, clothing is coming back now since people are out and about again. Furniture is is. Uh, is increasing, which suggests that people are either remodeling or, or thinking of buying new homes, or they are buying new homes, or they're getting refis and using the cash to, to, to redo the homes. Sporting goods are, 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 are up uh, both at month to month and year over year, because a lot of people were buying sporting goods when they were home to stay fit. Motor vehicles up, up substantially. People are buying uh, either new cars, new used cars, and of course, parts to fix their cars. And department store sales are, are coming back a little bit, but they're way off from a year ago. Bars and restaurants the same. Uh, gas stations uh, coming back a little bit. And then online, of course, is up for a month and up from a year ago for obvious reasons. And um, we can move. So the spending behavior not only changed between industries, but also between types of products within the same industry. Spending and clothing increased, as we said, 188%. People bought sports attire and tennis shoes, designer clothing, and accessory sales did not benefit from the increase of those sales. Furniture sales increased close to 90%. Sales on patio furniture, bookcases, home offices, and kids' finished furniture soared. Those items were not in high demand before the lockdown. The cash available. This is kind of interesting. So on the left here, we're seeing huge stores of cash, people putting cash in the bank. This, this is month, year, this is, I guess, uh, every quarter, how much cash is going into the banks. We're, we're seeing the last uh, three bars uh, for or I guess it's every month uh, since 2020 uh, have increased substantially. There's now over $4 trillion uh, in, in, 
in cash sitting in bank accounts or money markets. Uh, and that's because of this additional cash that's coming in every, every, every month right now. Uh, focus on home, consumers sharply have cut spending during the pandemic in some sectors while boosting outlays for groceries and items from home. Changes from a year earlier in the US retail spending for, uh, for the week ending June 6, as we can see still, uh, groceries are way up, home improvements are up, furniture's up, and of course the usuals are, are, are down, restaurants, apparel, department store, jewelry, lodging, I'm sure travel also. By the way, I forgot to mention for those of you who are new to this, this is supposed to be interactive. If you have questions, please email them. Are there any questions yet by chance? If there are, I'll, I'll take one or two before we begin. If the government institute WPA. Okay, okay, okay. If the government institute a WPA program, wouldn't that lower the unemployment number? Uh, you know, that's a, it's a great question. Obviously, uh, people are referring back to uh, the Great Depression when um, the government created the Work Projects Administration. I think that's what the WPA stands for. And uh, a lot of bridges, infrastructure, uh, and parks, uh, bridges uh, were built and built the roads, of course, uh, were built during that time. And so uh, I guess that would be one option. I think right now they're, they're looking at it more as trying to keep small businesses intact and have the small businesses hire people as opposed to government. It's really a, a, a question of, of which way you want to go on that and probably going both ways would, would make some, some sense. Okay, uh, let's talk about listings and sales. Uh, it is clearly a seller's market right now. Zillow has reported a, dec a decrease of 39% of new listings. Redfin reported a 25 increase, increase percent on buyers, but obviously uh, the, the real issue is, is that you have far too few listings for uh, the number of buyers that you have. Uh, there's a clear shortage in the housing inventory. Uh, new builders are, are reporting uh, month over month record sales uh, for uh, their, their inventory and they're running out of inventory also. Interest rates, of course, are at a record low. And so with that, you have uh, sellers who, who are in, in control of the market and, and realtors who are looking for listings and, and are having trouble finding listings because many people are still sheltering in place and, and are not in a position to want to, to relocate at, at this time. They also don't necessarily want people coming through their homes. And um, so until uh, the virus situation gets more under control, uh, that will probably be a static issue. The interesting part, of course, is that you have people buying homes sight unseen uh, with through 3D uh, imaging and, and, and very sophisticated uh, simulated walkthrough technology. People are able to actually see a home as if they're almost physically there, even if they put on a headset, an, an, an Oculus headset, they can almost feel like they're sitting in the home and get a feel for the home. And so I think we're gonna see more and more of technology being infused into the market and less people actually tangibly uh, go, walking through a home before they buy it. I mean, a lot of times when people rent homes, they don't really see it much before they move in. And I think we're gonna to start to see that mentality also uh, as we uh, proceed um, through uh, this evolution in, in, in society that we're all going through right, right now. Next slide. Uh, three generations under one roof, the search for more space, space. Telecommuting is becoming permanent and families need more space to accommodate home offices, high school graduates, have shifted their attention from elite schools to local colleges and are opting for staying at home for the fall or stay, certainly staying closer to home in the fall. Uh, most families are still hesitant on uh, returning aging parents to assisted living uh, senior facilities and uh, that is uh, you know, all gonna be issues. And so you have, in many cases, uh, three generations, uh, kind of like it was 100 years ago, living together. And, and in uh, some ways, uh, that's uh, you know, not bad, but it is what it is. Um, in many cases, it's almost like a kibbutz where everyone chips in and, and does their share to, to live together. Next page. Yeah. Oh, we have a question, excuse me. Okay. If people are afraid of the economy going down and if more jobs are lost, then why buy? Should we just continue to rent? Um, first of all, the, it's, the, the rental market may not provide as, as much opportunity currently as the purchase market does. Um, as the home builders that we've talked about in the past are, are, are shifting towards uh, building a rental housing market, uh, those opportunities will, will come about. But right now, if you're looking for space to uh, commute from home, if you have a multi-generational home, typically uh, most uh, apartment builders have built mainly one bedroom, is, is of course the biggest number. They built a fair number of two bedrooms, and the three bedrooms is the smallest inventory. And the reason is, is they don't make as much money per square foot on a three bedroom as they would on a, on a one or two bedroom. 
So the reality is you don't have as many three bedrooms out there. And so if you're a family, you end up having to uh, buy a home just because you need the space, you want the backyard, uh, and, and you want to maintain some social distancing, even, even among the family, so you can, you can work and, and, and not get in each other's hair and each other's nerves. So in a perfect world, renting may be good, but the reality is that if you're looking for space right now, uh, buying a home is, is probably your, your best option. Um, let's talk about refinancing because this, this is one reason why uh, it's a seller's market because prices are certainly not coming down on home. I wouldn't say that they're necessarily going up, but there, but there have been bidding wars uh, in terms of people buying homes and the prices are listed right by, by uh, good realtors. These homes are sometimes on the market for less than uh, 48 hours before, before they, someone gets an offer. Uh, but in terms of mortgage refinancing act activity, uh, we had hit a peak uh, earlier in, in the, uh, the cycle here, in, in maybe in April or May. Uh, uh, there, many of the banks and, and mortgage companies couldn't handle the volume, so they actually had to artificially increase interest rates. Interest rates are historically at a very, very low rate. The Federal Reserve has, has stated that they plan on keeping interest rates uh, very low for the foreseeable future until uh, these crises have, have abetted. And that, and that could take uh, some time. So in the meantime, you're seeing uh, uh, millions and millions of refis, much higher than, than we've had in the past. Right now, we're back to where we were in 2012, 2013, and, and it probably will stay at that level uh, for an extended period of time until there are there is no one left uh, to refinance because everyone will have a, a lower interest rate. And that will take probably a good six months to a year, if not even a half, to accomplish. And then you'll have, of course, new people buying homes that will continue to keep the, the, the market active. In terms of interest rates, uh, interest rates now for a 30-year fixed are, are well below 3.5. You know, and, and, and I've always not been the big proponent of a 30-year fixed. I think you're always paying extra interest for a home that you're likely not going to be in for 30 years. The average homeowner still only stays in their home between six and seven years. And so if you had a seven-year or a 10-year fixed that then uh, became an adjustable, you probably are, are in the high twos right now, and, and it may well be worth it. And you could always refinance in three or four years if you thought they were going to be staying there longer and still save a lot of money. Uh, but certainly a 30 year fix below three and a half, around uh, three and a quarter or whatever uh, it is right now is, is, as we can see, something that we haven't seen in, in a very long time and um, will probably remain at this level for, for some time. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about remote closing and buying sight unseen. Uh, are there any questions? Or? No, there's two questions. Okay, let me, let me go to another question if I may. Are house, uh, are house builders in a better position than they were entering the 2008 financial crisis? I, I think home builders are in a much better situation. I think their access to capital, their access to cash, the value of their stocks uh, is, is, is giving them the, the ability to, to get very inexpensive money right now. Uh, and and uh, because the government is supporting that, they, they will have access to the Federal Reserve to, to issue bonds that the, that the Federal Reserve will purchase, and that bond money can then be used to purchase homes, which will then, in theory, help uh, home buyers uh, buy a home at, at a competitive market rate, and then also get uh, a mortgage at also a competitive rate. So, so um, home builders, I think, are in much better shape than they, than they were uh, 12, 12 years ago. Another question? In the age of social distancing, how do realtors sell houses? Is electronic selling a, buyer, a, a viable option? And, and the answer, uh, which, I, which I briefly addressed, is, is that um, through technology and through uh, videoing and through uh, 3D imaging, um, there's going to be uh, remarkable opportunities to sell homes virtually sight unseen. And uh, we're seeing a lot of folks from New York and, and the Northeast who want to be permanently down here, maybe they can telecommute, maybe they're partially retired, and they, and they feel that, that they'll just uh, have more space and be able to be outdoors more. I mean, the reality is uh, this virus uh, seems to impact those people who spend more time indoors. If you're spending more time outdoors, uh, you, the likelihood that you're getting the virus is less. And even in Florida, if it's spiking, it, it's, it's spiking because obviously people aren't social distancing, but it's also because people are spending more time in the summer indoors, like the folks up north spend time indoors during the winter. And so in, in a perfect world, you, you want to be in an environment where you, you are spending uh, less time indoors in the, with, with other people you, that you're not cocooning with, not bubbling with, not, not, not uh, uh, hibernating with uh, in such a way that you can be outdoors. And so Florida does provide that opportunity. Of course, uh, if too many people are in one location outdoors, whether it's a concert or at the beach, that, that becomes an issue. But 
in terms of buying a home, people relish the idea of having their own backyard, their own pool, and their own little area where, where they can spend time out, outdoors. So I do think that uh, uh, there'll be remarkable opportunities to sell to folks sight unseen or virtually sight unseen during, during this, this crisis. Anything else? Okay, let's go to the next question. Uh, I mean, the next, next slide. So I, I want to talk a little bit about um, remote closings and, 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 and how that is working because it's, it's really very, very important. Um, but before we do that, I want to talk a little bit more about buying sight on scene. Buy, buyers are more willing to make offers uh, on places that they've only visited virtually. Why? There's an e-commerce culture in place. Online shopping is ingrained in our minds and buying a house online was the last step to complete the e-commerce uh, cycle. There are uh, not many properties on the market and it's causing bidding wars, as I've said, and uh, families are moving to other locations, but traveling is still somewhat restricted. Uh, there's no chance to make trips for, for touring properties. And so that's why we have to rely more on technology. Uh, realtors with a complete for portfolio of trustworthy networking partners, whether they're inspectors, contractors, cleaning companies, lawyers, et cetera, uh, will be uh, the, the big winners. So now I will talk about online uh, notarization and, uh, and talk about how that plays into buying virtually. So, so we've had situations where people up north have sold or purchased homes down here and, and they were not here and they didn't need to be here because of this new technology and new legislation that, that has, has come about. So um, in terms of the online notary requirements, uh, the first thing is that uh, the acknowledgement of ele an electronically signed documents are, are done through what's called RON, Remote Online Notary. Uh, and, and they are done through unique, special technology platforms that are created uh, specifically for this purpose that have been approved by, by each state. Uh, let me talk about the conditions and the restrictions because this is really most important, especially if you're a realtor. You typically have to be a U.S. citizen with an established credit history to pass a knowledge-based authentication protocol. So that means you could be an American in Japan or anywhere else in the world uh, and you want to buy something back in the United States or sell something, and we could do online notarization. You also could go to the U.S. consulate if it was open. You could also go to a private notary if, you, if they were available. Sometimes they're not, and sometimes they're, they're too expensive. Um, so you would be able to use remote online notarization overseas uh, right now. Historically, in the past, you could have used a civil law notary such as myself. You could have sent me to Japan or anywhere else in the world, to Central America, to actually take a, a, a notarization in person. But unfortunately, because of travel restrictions, that too now has become rather improbable. Um, right now, online notarizations are allowed for transactions up to $3 million, and they have to be approved by your lender in writing. Uh, the process typically uh, needs to be completed within 48 hours, and the, and the notary must be affiliated with a particular title agency. Uh, there are approved vendors uh, such as Pavasio, Essential, Notarize.com, NotaryCam, uh, Zoom, or FaceTime, or or anything like that are not approved. Those are those are just social portals, uh, but they are not uh, legitimate e-notarization portals that, that, that can perform e-notarization. So if someone's telling you that they're gonna use Zoom or FaceTime, you, you need to find someone else who does this for a living. Any questions? Okay, next page. So I wanna talk about the procedures for remote, for remote online notarization. Now I wanna be clear that there's two kinds of online notarization. You have remote online notarization, and you have what's called a RIN, remote, remote ink notarization. And I'm gonna talk now first about the online notarization. And that is where there are closing documents that are uploaded by the notary or title company to an approved ROM platform. The principal then creates an account, meaning the person who's gonna be signing the documents on, on the platform. They have to review all the documents prior to closing, uh, and then they go through a verification process. Assuming they have been verified and that we can identify who they are by their driver's license, having asked the right questions. Uh, at closing, the individual then will sign all documents electronically with an electronic pen while the notary uh, witnesses uh, the notarization, typically online. The notary could physically be there, but if they were physically there, you wouldn't need to do this. So they're presumably gonna be, like I'm on screen right now, watching you sign a document, uh, and we would be in two-way communication, and I would be able to see you. Funding then happens when the title agent receives the fully executed digital closing package back, it's been reviewed, approved, and then funding occurs. Um, so that's remote online notarization. Any questions on that before we do remote ink notarization? Okay. So, and by the way, obviously Western Title, which is our sister company that we've been involved with for, for almost 30 years, 
uh, is heavily involved with this. I'm personally involved with it. Jeff Sherman is, Ellen is, uh, my entire staff is, and we were one of the first title companies to embrace uh, remote online and, and, and remote ink notarization. Now, the, in all candor, remote ink notarization seems to be the way that the banks favor, you know, are favoring. Uh, there are very few banks that, that are willing to do a remote online notarization because they still want a wet ink note, presumably because of the foreclosure crisis that occurred 12 years ago and they were accused of forge, forge, you know, forging their, their wet ink notes and photocopying them and destroying them and they didn't have original copies. So they've been shell-shocked and want a wet ink note. Don't blame them. In addition, some banks still want a wet ink mortgage. That I don't fully understand because once the mortgage is recorded in the public records electronically, having a wet ink mortgage is, is, is immaterial, but I guess they're concerned again of, of about maybe some the fact that maybe someone didn't sign it and they still want a wedding. But but assuming you have uh, just a cash deal, a remote online notarization is a no-brainer. The banks aren't involved. You have a buyer, a seller, no bank, and both can sign remotely. And we have done those closings many times already, and they've been they've gone over very smoothly. Remote online notarization for including banks is probably the holy grail in the title industry, and there are very few banks and very few title companies I can say that they have done a remote online notarization when a mortgage and note was involved. So what we have is this hybrid, this hybrid which is called remote ink notarization. And that's it, when the paper version of the docs are sent overnight to the person who has to sign the documents. And then they're also uploaded by the notary or the title company to the wrong platform. So you really have two things going on. You're sending the original documents to, to the, per, the buyer or the seller, uh, and at the same time, you're uploading the documents to the notarization platform. The principal, the person who signed them, signs the documents with both electronic and wet signatures. So they sign it twice. They sign the promissory note once, like wet, and another time just to be held in the system online. And then the notary is, is like here, watch, like I'm watching you or you're watching me right now, there to approve the transaction. And all wet signed documents are sent overnight to the title agent to be physically notarized, because then we physically have to stamp the note with the wedding documents, and, and then they're submitted for recording and forwarded to the lender. Funding happens when the title agent is in physical possession of the full, fully executed wedding documents. So RIN, a remote in ink notarization, is also frequently called uh, by mortgage brokers and realtors as a hybrid remote closing. So they're different terms, and I just want you all to remember what they are because they're really important if you're in the, in the industry. You have remote online, which is called RON. RIN is remote ink notarization. And finally, remote ink is sometimes also called a hybrid remote closing. Are there any questions? Because we're, we're literally almost out of time. Um, any questions? Yeah, we have, we have two, two questions left. Uh, okay, what, okay. Uh, when are we likely to see, uh, no, I'm not gonna answer that. On the, on the online notary, do you, who, would you recommend for remote closing? As I mentioned, I mean, we, we have Western title. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're good at this. This is what we do. Uh, but, you know, there, there are tons of other folks who probably are as good, but we'd like to think that we're as good, if not better, and provide better value and, and also help sponsor Zoom at noon. Um, and what's the next question? Uh, is Ron just uh, Florida closings or nationwide? Each state has its own Ron uh, type of statute. Not every state has it. Some have emergency orders. But what's interesting is, is that you could, in theory, use a Florida RON closing uh, notarization process to close in other states. It depends if those states have lesser restrictions than, than, than Florida has, assuming that they don't. You could do it, but you could also do use a civil law notary in the state of Florida, and that would have to be accepted by every state in the union because of, uh, of, of the way civil law notary works around, around the world. Okay, what recourse does one have if having purchased a house by virtual reality find a different reality with opening the front door? Well, that's a great question. I mean, if you're buying it as is and you're buying it virtually, you know, I, I think you're, you're gonna be uh, talking to your realtors, you're gonna be talking to your inspectors, and you're gonna be talking to your lawyers. So, so I mean, those, those are issues and, and you really have to be very thorough and have good people on the ground who can, who can do the walkthroughs for you. Okay, I have one more question. Uh, do you think that closings will ever return to the traditional closing table? Um, probably not. Probably not. I, I, I don't think that uh, you, you will have as many traditional closings as we had in the past. It's kind of like asking me if I, if I think retail is going back to the malls and the stores. And the answer is probably not. People are so accustomed to having packages delivered, you know, calling up on a Sunday or a Monday and having the stuff delivered Monday night or Tuesday. People are just so accustomed to that happening. I think they're going to become very accustomed to the luxury of being able to close 
you know, from the beach, from their car, from their office, from their home, uh, as they have uh, in, in the past. Um, and I am being written a note, so let's just see what the note says. Um, thank you. Uh, oh, and finally, uh, as you know, we have been constantly updating our COVID-19 page, uh, and it provides very useful information about unemployment, the PPP, the EIDL loan, and, and other useful information. And, that, and that's being kept up by uh, Paolo Vergara and by Ellen. And so um, I, I do recommend it's on our webpage at, at oppenheimlaw.com. Again, we're out of time, but I want to thank you all. Uh, Roy Oppenheim, on behalf of Oppenheim Law, and, and of course also Weston Title. And we uh, look forward to uh, seeing you next week at Zoom at noon. Have a great one.